Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We're so happy you're here tonight um, at the North Carolina Museum of Art. My name is Valerie Hillings, and I'm the director of the museum. And it is my distinct pleasure this evening to welcome two powerhouse ladies. <laughs> Such a thrill to have them here. <laughs> I'm going to do a little bit of traditional biography, although I have a feeling everybody in this audience knows who we're, we're about to hear from. Um, born in Alamance County and raised in Orange County, Jackie Shelton Green is the first African-American and third woman to be appointed to be a North Carolina Poet Laureate. Um, Green won the North Carolina Award for Literature in 2013 and was inducted into the North Carolina Literary Hall of Fame in 2014. The author of multiple books of poetry, co-editor of poetry anthologies, author of a play. Um, she is our first poet in residence here at the North Carolina Museum of Art. And we're thrilled that she's with us for two years. And so keep your eye out for many exciting um, events to come. We were really excited that um, she had the idea of, of inviting her wonderful friend, Grammy Award nominated jazz vocalist, composer, actress, Nina Freelon, um, also a, a friend, longtime friend of the museum, thanks to her wonderful husband who was on our board and of course was one of the great greatest architects of our time. Um, so really great. Ms. Freelon recently starred in the critically acclaimed show, Georgia On My Mind, celebrating the music of Ray Charles. She's no stranger to the music of that singer who she toured with Charles, as well as many other great artists, including Ellis Marsalis, Al Jarreau, George Benson, Earl Cloak, and Take Six. Um, our two distinguished guests this evening will discuss, um, will discuss Phil Freelon, who is the subject of our current exhibition, Container Contained, Phil Freelon Design Strategies for Telling African-American Stories. I think discussing from a personal level his career and various ways um, that he constructed an expanded space for himself as an African American in the field of architecture. Importantly, though, they are also going to explore creativity, healing, grief, and joy through poetry and personal reflections. Please join me in welcoming Jackie Shelton Green and Nina Freelon. Thank you, thank you, thank you for thank breathing you. the storm. The storm. <laughs> it might get a little stormy in here. We know what to do. We know, we know how to stir it up, don't we? Yeah, but we know how to bring the sunshine too. So thank you, Nina, for joining me in conversation. Mm -hmm. I am always grateful for the grace, that magic that we weave when we gather in the circle of sisterhood allowing our hearts and our creativity to take over and guide the focus of our conversations. We've been here before. Truth. Not on this couch, but some couches. <laughs> We've been here before, sharing and reflecting what it means to be inside of the container. As a documentary poet, I believe that we're all human museums. I believe that all of us are full of exhibit rooms that contain and keep our life stories, our histories, and our histories. Some of these rooms are open and might be for public view. And some of these rooms are closed, protected, archived, and sometimes hidden or buried. This evening, Nina and I are going to talk about how we've made space for our sorrows and our joys inside these rooms. And before we go down this rabbit hole of healing, grief, and joy, I want Nina to share some reflections on her musical journey. I'd like for Nina to talk about herself outside of being the great Phil Freelon's husband, <laughs> but as Nina Freelon herself, because you all can go downstairs, right? And just learn all you want to learn about Phil. But tonight is about Nina. Tonight's about Nina and Jackie. We're just going to own that. Um, so Nina, how did the Nina Freelon that we know emerge as an internationally Grammy-nominated, world-renowned vocalist? I think it's important that you tell us a little bit about that story. It was a circuitous path, not straight, 
but round, around children and marriage and within children and marriage. And I, I believe that being a singer has made me a better mother and wife and being a mother and wife and grandmother. Did I say grandmother? Say grandma. Let me say it again. Has made me a better artist. Creative endeavors, all of those things. And I try to carry my whole self to the stage. How did that start? In church. Singing in church. You know, um, being loved by that, those, those women and those men who would put their hands on your shoulder and say, baby, you warm my heart. Um, those human beings who loved me up on stage, so to speak. Um, that was my start. And every Thursday, choir rehearsal was part of my conservatory training, learning to sing with others, um, learning to move spirit through the body. It wasn't enough to sh just show up. You had to show up present and allow spirit to flow through you. And that I carried through to my life on, on other stages. And it wasn't a pretense, it wasn't a pretend. You were to reveal yourself in these moments. And, and, and I think I also learned early on that this talent was not mine. It was not, it was not mine to exploit. It was bequeathed to me as a gift to the community that I was in. And so when my mother would take me to sing to the sick and shut in, who knows what sick and shut in are? Yes. And I would rather be outside playing jump rope, but I had to go sing to the sick and shut in. My grandmother would bring a Bible. She would read, she'd bring a little program from the church and I would be asked to sing, you know, something. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And never would you ask for a cent or think that this was a paid performance. This was the gift through you to your community. And so I, I feel blessed that I came up in that kind of environment because when I got the opportunity to sing on larger stages, I was a visiting artist for the state of North Carolina, sang in every hoot and holla in this state, all 100 counties. Um, I carried that, also that assurance of knowing who I was and whose I was. Um, there was a little disconnect with devil's music versus the music of God, but I quickly got over that, believing that Billie Holiday channeled as much fervor and desire and um, holiness in her, um, in her reaching for something that she did not have that anybody else did in one of those uh, sacred texts. It felt like the same thing to me. So. Nina Freeland. <laughs> you ask her a question. Don't ask and me. she sings. <laughs> Y'all don't get too many opportunities to have this for free. <laughs> but this is wonderful. And um, that fullness that you talk about, that uh, I remember in Lee Smith one time, she and I were sitting at some big conference and a person that had flown in from New York to Duke was up at the mic and they were reading his like eight page Vita. And I remember that Lee Smith turned to me and she said, but who is people, who we belong to? So the work that we do comes from that container of belonging. 
that container of community. And every time that I work with you, Nina Freelon, I had to say your whole name, I'm always struck by your mindfulness, by your exactness, and the fullness that you bring to every project, that fullness that you just talked about. So please talk about your relationship with your journey of creativity, because, you know, as a writer and people talk to me about their, their writing or their, their art as a creative maker, my question is always, what is your relationship with your creativity? A lot of people don't have a relationship with their art. And I believe that I'm just stupid enough to believe that one has to have a relationship with whatever we're making. So Nina, talk about that journey with your creativity. You know, I, that's such an awesome question. I can always expect those golden burnished questions from you. No silly, no silly questions. <laughs> you know, my creative life has taught me who I am. Sometimes you don't know who you are until you do that thing. You have had no experience. It's not as if I was um, on a path that said, I want to do this all my life. As I said, I went around Robin's barn. And so I decided um, that I wanted to be a hospital administrator. That sounded like good and safe, right? That sounded like I could be contributing to the world. Why was it that I was always in the patient's room and singing? singing? Why, why is that? So my creativity, even in those environments, was, was teaching me who I needed to be. So that reflection, you build something with your hands, and it says to you, here you are, tiny wonder. You write something, and it reflects back to you. Wow, was that in me all along? And the more you do this dance, the more comfortable it gets. The problem, the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem becomes when you put it in a closet and you shut it away and you give it no light or water or cookie. My creative muse needs cookies. I don't know what yours do. You know, some cookies are always good. Um, when you feed it, it will feed you without fail, without fail. Indeed. You know, I, I often, uh, in a speech that I give often about creativity as medicine, I'm always talking about an anorexic muse. Um, does not serve one. You have to feed her. And this notion that the muse is over there, that one really has to get, you know, I used to believe that I had to own a mountain chalet or a beach house. I used to believe because all of my, my colleagues had beach houses or mountain chalets that I ran off to, to work on their next novel or their new manuscript. Well, I didn't have that. And I've come to learn that the muse is not over there, that the muse is inside of us if we feed her. And I also believe that you have to train her. When folks start talking about writer's block and I can't I know. produce any music, like train the girl, train the muse. She serves us, we don't serve her that relationship again? How do we have that relationship where we're always cultivating and always digging? Um, and that brings me, Nina, to talking about creativity as medicine. I'm remembering that very glorious sunny morning where we met to discuss the invitation that you and Phil had extended to me to be the first officiant to speak at the opening of North Star Church of the arts. We talked a lot that morning about creativity as medicine, what it means when art calls us to be intentional as we stand shoulder to shoulder and all of our good, our joy, 
and our sorrows. I know that the creation of North Star Church of the Arts was a very strategic, intentional act of love. So please talk about the creation of North Star Church of the Arts and how North Star Church of the Arts, and if folk don't know about it, you really should Google it and show up for their services. How it's a portal and also a container for so many people in our community. Thank you for asking about North Star. It's Phil's and, and it's our legacy product, project. Um, it's a building in Durham, in the heart of downtown, where gentrification is going wild. Everywhere you look, there's a new structure rising up from the ground. And I think Phil could see that. I think he could imagine that. And he wanted to draw a line in the sand that said right here is a space for all people, regardless of their particularity. And the intersection of the arts and spirit is not a new idea. But when we use church in our name, we use it intentionally because we are recreating the meaning of church. church. Churches are our most divided spaces on this planet. We got the Baptists, we got the Methodists, we got the Episcopalians and the Catholics. We have the Buddhists, we have the Baha'i, which we just still trying to figure that out. We have those who believe, um, you know, who are, who are atheists. And we have all of these different people in our churches are dividing places for us. He was like, no, I want to use the arts as a touchstone. Come and be who you are and let that reach each other spirit to spirit. And so that's what North Star Church of the Arts is. We've been impacted like everyone during this pandemic. But rather than for me personally to look at the pandemic as a bad thing, I feel like it's actually been an interesting thing. Um, a space for us to think about who, how we want to be in relationship to our community. What is really needed at this moment? How to be quiet and sit in a space of waiting and not get, you know, because I'm a doer. I'm like, come on now, let's do it. But these past two years have said, be still. Be still. And so I have learned some valuable, valuable lessons. Um, North Star is still ramping up, but because we were so new when the pandemic hit, we are still babies. And we, we're just starting to toddle back out, but we don't have really hard, bad lessons to unlearn. That's good, right? You know, we can just take that exhale, ask our community, what is it that they need now? Because it's different than it was two years ago. So one of the things we were just speaking about was, and I may have to invite you back for this. In fact, I will invite you back. I'll just put it in the ethers. A blessing for the artists to come and we create ritual around what it is that we that's been placed in us and you said creativity is medicine absolutely it is medicine um but let us come as artists and be blessed by each other you know speak into existence your your um your art and have others wrap their arms around you and say ashe yes it will yes yes we need that because our, we're like this, we're, we've been in such a heightened state of anxiety for so long, we, don't, we think that's normal. We think we're supposed to be walking around with our jaws tight. Right. Well, I remember that morning after the service, how many, many people in the audience 
were weeping. It was a moment for people to exhale. There were so many invitations being spoken into that, that space. So many people who feel marginalized, erased, invisible, not heard, not seen inside of community showed up and found a space for themselves. So um, it's very humbling to, to feel like we're the architects of, um, I use the word architect, that we're the architects along with Phil, you know, of, of building these bridges where people can come and all of their everything, whatever their everything is. So this takes us to, um, you know, getting ready to be personal. When I allow myself to slow down and enter the wild messiness of my wounded heart, it's the place also where I learn to source some of my deepest creative inspiration. And it's also where I find my soul's uniquely coded medicine. A love letter to our hearts for us, Nina and Jackie. We cannot prevent the birds of sorrow from flying over our heads, but we can refuse to let them build nest in our hair. Who stops to record the whimpering of an ocean? I've seen you wrestling with the frozen tears of a moon. I know how you measure and weigh your own heartbeats with the stretching of olive branches. I've heard you scold the wind for changing her song. I listen to you scrape your crystallized tears from the roof of your mother's grave, from the hem of your sister's shroud, from my daughter's sweater. I have watched prayers crawl up your arms, dig into your heart. I've become blinded by all the light that lives there, all the light that your hands are harvesting, all the love you offer to each morning. Black is the color of my true love's hair. His face so soft and wondrous fair. The purest eyes and the strongest hands. I love the ground. I love the ground. I love the ground. I don't know where he stands. Black. Of my true love's hair, of my true love's, of my true beloved love's, of my true love's hair. We have all of us lost something. Or perhaps we only think we have lost something or someone. My beloved is gone in many, many ways. I love the ground on where he stands. I love the ground on where he stands. I love the ground. He's gone. 
in many ways, but in many ways he is present, whispering in my ear that goofy sense of humor, encouraging me, telling me to get up and get moving, reminding me of the promises made to myself. Gone, but not like I thought. Mm. Need a free line. Mm. So let's talk about that medicine. Mm. I know that Phil and your sister journeyed beyond this realm very close together in time. What helped you to break through the rubble? Or what containers did you create to hold the rawness? This is why we're not talking about the exhibit downstairs. Because you can come to the museum and have that experience. But it is rare when we are in spaces because this culture does not encourage us to talk about our sorrows. Our culture teaches us to tight lip it, sew it up, and put on that face for the world. But some of us believe in healing. Well, you know, you can't be healed if you keep it to yourself. Right. Because you're up there pretending you're all right, and no one extends any help because you look so strong. And you look good. And you look good. When you're looking strong. So some people, my mother used to say, you don't have to look bad to be feeling bad. Mm. Those containers. Do you have a container garden at home? Uh, yes. When the rabbits and the deers <laughs> have not had their feast. I know, right? So... I, um, I have a container garden. So I have my kitchen garden and it has my basil and my sage and my oregano and, you know, a few things that I don't know what they are, but they taste really, really nice. And they all have different personalities, you know, and grief has different personality. Um, so I have some some mint, which I thought, why well, put it in a container? I imagine mojitos and other things. So let it just go. Well, it has spread all over everything. My whole backyard smells like mint. I understand why people say put it in a container because it will take over. The mint and the lemon balm are having a fight. They're having a fight. So I am learning what a container can do if you let your grief grow over everything. There will be no space for you. So you create this space, be it music, be it meditation, be it dance, be it poetry, be it whatever, so that it can live and you can tend it. When it gets unruly, snip, 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 snip and put it in an adult beverage. <laughs> I'm just saying. Or lemonade, mint, you know, something. Um, and it can be a beautiful thing. A strangely beautiful thing. Now, there are these plants that are divas. Cilantro is one of them. And too much sun, not enough water. Okay, too much shade. I'm wilting. I have spaces. You talked about this early on, these rooms in your museum. The, the cilantro is in a closed closet because, you know, she's so special. She's so special. My basil is going, ha ha. I can grow even when you don't water me at all. 
you've been gone for two weeks. I'm still here. Cilantro is like, I'm dead. After two days. There are parts of your grief journey you must attend to on a daily basis. You must go back, you must taste, you must walk, you must massage, you must, and other areas that are growing without you watching. And when you come back, you're like, I actually feel better in this space. I actually feel like I am growing in this space. So being aware of the medicine that you are creating, and I'm a journaler, so I can look back at my journey, journals and know that I'm getting better. Because at the very beginning of the grief journey, I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of being in the house by myself. I was afraid if I heard, heard a door shut, I was afraid of being alone and with people and everything scared me because the thing that wasn't supposed to happen did. Yes. Nothing felt safe. I'm better in that arena now. Am I through this thing? No, mm -mm, not by a long shot. Because you don't get better from grief. You grow into it and through it and become a brand new creature. Indeed. Wow. Um, this notion, I, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you and I'm thinking a lot about Phil smile the last time I saw him, which was that morning at, at North Star. And I'm thinking about my daughter, Imani, and her last smile, which was the day before she died. And I'm thinking um, about what remains. And we are what remains. We are what remains. When my daughter Imani died in 2009 at the age of 38, I could not access the medicine inside of me. I tried and I tried and I tried to write, but I couldn't. It was not until 2017 that I could surrender to the wound. That wound kept asking me, where did I keep the medicine? The wound kept asking, where's the medicine? Where do you keep it? And I'm reminded that Clarissa Pincola Estes, the author of Women Who Run With the Wolves, said that one creative act can cause a torrent to break through stone. One creative act can cause a torrent to break through stone. So I wrote the long poem, I Want to Undie You, as the wail that was lodged inside of my bones, that was lodged inside of my throat, that sacred rage. The poem became a roar, tearing through all the portals, declaring that I had not forgotten, not forgotten how to allow space for the divine feminine revolutionary that I am. The writing of I Want to Undie You, a tribute to my daughter, helped me to re-enter into my conscious awareness amidst all of this justified sacred rage. That rage reminded me that the creative muse and the medicine woman still live inside of me. I am their containers, and they are my containers for the truth-telling and for the witness. It is the torrent that broke through the stone. So Nina, in 2021, you broke through some storm and stone. In 2021, Nina Freelon delivered her first album in more than a decade, Time Traveler, which you consider the passage of time through the prism of personal loss. That album is a tribute to the memory of your husband of 40 years, Phil Freelon, who died in 2019. I'd like for you to share with all of us how you journeyed into the core of the sonic love letter and how that sonic love letter 
This album is the container for your grief. I was afraid. I'm just being honest, I was afraid. Before Phil passed, I was working on a tribute, a, a, actually a birthday present for him. Songs that I knew he loved. Um, nothing that would live in the world in the way Time Traveler did. Something, a sweet gift to my beloved. Because you see, you see, you see, we knew that according to the doctors, it was a limited amount of time. And that brought such a strange reality. They said three to five, three to five, three to five, three to five years. Now, three years with ALS might seem like a long time or a very short time. But it is a container of sorts for doing things that you know you likely won't have the chance to do if you wait. I recorded these songs. We were getting ready to mix them, give, you know, to, in time for his birthday, which was in March. And his health declined such that I was like, I can't be worried about making a record. I have to attend to my life. And so that's what I did. And I left that recording project on a high shelf. Some months after he died, well, as he was making his transition, he made me promise that I would not stop singing. One of the things that really, really made him sad was the idea that his illness would freeze me, make me into someone that I wasn't. And so he made me promise. And I'll tell you, there were days when it was very hard. I said yes, but I didn't know how I was gonna keep that promise. After he passed, some friends of mine were like, girl, you need to go back and revisit that music. I listened to it and I felt like wherever it was, that's not where I was. I was different, I was changed. I was not the me that made those, re those recordings. So they were like, well, let's go back in the studio then. Let's do you where you are right now. The, the, here's the problem though. The voice is a very sensitive instrument. I didn't know what was gonna come out. And so my prayer became, oh, Lord, please let me have a slice of what I had. Let me have a little bit, just a, just a taste of the old me, the me who could hold a note, the me who could make a note spin and shine just a little bit of it. I don't even want the whole thing. Just give me a slice. Girl, when I tell you, when I went into that studio, it's not as if I hadn't been vocalizing, but not in front of anyone. What came through was broken in such a way that I was astounded. And that's how I knew it was God or the great I am or whatever you want to call it, because God never brings you back to where you used to be. God always moves you forward. The spirit always gives you that little extra, as they say. My grandmother used to say extra. It was like, it's not extra, it's extra. She was like, it's extra. <laughs> that thing, that grace that you don't deserve, you didn't ask for, that's what came through. And that's what ended up on this record. Mm -hmm. To be acknowledged by my peers with a Grammy nomination was something I didn't, because I was not even, it wasn't even about that. But when that came through, I was like, okay, this is totally out of my hands and none of my business, apparently. But you know, it's what the world needed. We all needed a sonic love letter because we were all hurting. I remember getting your CD in the mail 
and it interrupted my entire day. There was no dinner cooked. There was no manuscript reviewed. There were no deadlines met that day. It was me and Nina, compassionate listening, listening. Would you grace us? A little shum shum. Shum shum. A shum shum. Sure. She gives a little shum shum from the CD. Sure, something from the CD. They're, they're, you got a nice audience. Look at them. Yeah, they look friendly. They look friendly. They look friendly. Some of them look like they're enjoying it. Like they might be present. They're good people. You give them a little shum shum. A little shum shum. Some of y'all know what that means. Let's show them. I'm going to love you like no. Nobody's love you. Come rain or come shine. High as a mountain deep. As a river, come rain or come shine. I guess when you met me, it was just one of those things. But don't ever bet me. Cause I'm gonna be true if you let me. You're gonna love me like nobody's love me. Come rain or come shine. Happy together or unhappy together. And won't it be, won't it be fine? The days may be cloudy or sunny, and we're in or we're out of the money. Mm -hmm, but I'm with you always. I'm with you, rain or shine, rain or shine. Thank you. Woo. I love some, some. All of the songs on this album are hauntingly beautiful. They're sirens. And they help all of us to realize that bearing witness to these powerful truths of how purposeful creative medicine is so much bigger and broader than the narrow confines of what we know in these westernized hemispheres of our hearts and brains medicine, heart medicine, compassionate heart medicine. We have witnessed our own healing and the healing of others through creativity. Our songs and our poems demonstrate how these embodied lessons stay with us. And now we invite you to think about what is your creative medicine? What is your creative medicine? And where does it live inside of your human museum? What does this medicine mean to you? Because we all have it. Where does it hurt? Where does it hurt? How do we answer the call of the wound? How do we attend to the wound? What are your personal practices of healing? All of us are creative makers, every single one of us. We are also, all of us, our ancestors' wildest dreams. They could not have thunk it. 
ask, what is your relationship with your creativity? And before we open this up for questions, Nina and I have a little shopping shopping to do for you. Nina, my sister, not sister, not sister, my sister, received my call when I called her and said, Nina, I'm doing something I've never done before. I'm going to have an album. And I said, Nina, I need you to sing one of my poems. And I remember she said, okay, I got Sunday. That's all you get because I'm flying out. Like, you, you better make it good. And I was like, okay. Yeah, it was perfect. I was terrified. I was terrified. Not terrified. I was terrified. Like, Nina Freeline, don't sing your poem. No rehearsal. One take. Because that's how we do. That's how we, that's how we do. And it was done. The river speaks of thirst. Oh, how I want to sit here and sing into your night. Lean deep inside the elbows of this river where blood is born. Sing a litany into this open book of your story, my story. This river shrugs its belly, births kindness for all things yet to be born. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh I, I want to sit here and sing into your night. Deep inside the elbows of this river where blood is born. Oh, how I want to sit here and feast from your wet palms. This river, wounded heart, holding the locked secrets of ancestral crones, kneeling, feeding the doorways of all my, your drowned seasons. Kneeling, feeding, kneeling, feeding the doorways of all my, your all my, you're all my, your drowned seasons. Oh, how I want to be born inside this river as a lone wild burst of yellow, becoming more and more an eclipse of wind, becoming more and more an eclipse of freedom. We are all this flow. We are all this river where blood is born. Becoming more and more. Becoming more and more. Becoming more and more and more and more. An eclipse of the wind becoming more. Eclipse of freedom. We are all this flow. We are all this flow. We are all this flow. We are all this river where blood is born. Oh, how I yearn to empty the veins of my life story into this nameless pregnant river. Like you, like me, it also struggles to remember its own birthing, its own flow. Wide, deep story that swallows forest, that births newness inside the whisper of the story 
this hungry thunder. Mm -hmm. I yearn, oh, how I yearn to empty the veins of my life story into this nameless pregnant river like you like me like you like me it also struggles to remember oh it struggles to remember its own birthing and its own flow oh how i yearn to bear such freedom hold the bones the stones the skeletons of moon sun dust inside mouth womb spirit tomb conjure a dervish of primal ancient becoming we swallow more and more of this river where blood is born we shape shift into the sweet shadows of this river's dance this river's prayer howling when it runs backwards, remembering other names, other skins, other songs, it's birthed and sung. your <laughs> day. We shape shift into the sweet shadows. We shape shift into the sweet, sweet shadows of this river's dance, this river's prayer. Howling -ha 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 when it runs backwards. Howling -ha 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 when it runs backwards. Remembering other names, other skins, other songs is birthed and sung. Thank you. Jackie Shelton Green, Nina Freeline. And now we invite questions, comments, dances, songs, money. <laughs> Thank you both. That was absolutely inspirational. Ms. Freeline, I saw you 21 years ago in Ronnie Scott's in London. <laughs> Twice in a week, I was new to jazz. I didn't really know anything about it, but that really just started a love affair with jazz. And since then, I've been all into it. Um, my question is, since that time, and I guess you've already addressed this somewhat, because obviously, you've lived 20 years of life since then, and gone through a lot of change, growth, development. I wonder, reflecting back on that young woman that I saw in Ronnie Scott's, is she all that different from who you are now, or would you consider yourself fundamentally the same? Wow, what a question. First of all, it's uh, the same young woman. Uh, <laughs> you know, the things that we gather along the way in our life's travel are added unto us. And where there are things, you never know what tomorrow brings or takes away. Hopefully there's an essential nugget that remains and continues to grow and glow in different ways. So I cannot say exactly um, who I am versus this, this woman who was at Ronnie Scott's some 20 years ago. I have compassion for her. She was worried about far too much. Um, took herself far too seriously. And now I am way, I can say I'm, I'm much more relaxed, much more comfortable in my own skin, much more aware that I'm enough and have always been enough. I don't think I knew it then. 
but I know it now. Well, there is the smoke and the mirror. No, it's, it's, you know, you change in small ways and large ways. Wouldn't you agree, Jackie? Like you just... Depends on the day of the week. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But great question. Um, great question. I knew Mina, Nina way, way, way back. I used to, um, I had serious girl crush and used to show up every night, every weekend that you performed at George's Restaurant oh, downstairs oh and University Square. Oh my gosh. What was it called? That was his first restaurant in Chapel I don't even Hill. remember. It was downstairs. Downstairs. Was it, was it Bob? No, it was not. It was before that. No, it was, it was Chapel Hill. No, 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 no. No, that's, that's his name. Um, no, what was the name of it? It was called something else. This is downstairs in what used to be University Square, but it, it, it had another name because it had been a French restaurant. No, 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 no. Downstairs, University Square. I can see the place. I just, I mm -hmm. can't remember. Anyway, we know the place. It was George's first restaurant in Chapel Hill. Yeah. I cannot think of the name. It was not Bakashash. No, I, I, if you call it, I know it. No, mm -mm. he never had a restaurant by his name. He's never had a restaurant called Bakashash. No, he has a restaurant. Oh, we're, we're like, we're gone somewhere else. Okay. Gone somewhere um, else. <laughs> We've gone somewhere else. Can't remember it. But that's, that's how long she's been just a powerful keg of voice and presence. And Phil was always there. Phil was always there. Protector. Sound engineer. Yeah. Monitor Don't get too carrier, close to my driver. wife. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? New Mighty Quiet Bunch. In the back. Uh, when you were speaking about um, training your muse, especially in terms of uh, when it comes to writing, do you have a particular discipline or do you believe in a particular discipline in terms of a, like a daily practice? For me, it's being available. What does it mean to be available to our muse? It's being available, creating that space where she wants to show up. You know, um, a lot of times when, when I ask people, what's, what, what's blocking you? What's keeping you from showing up inside of your authenticity or just being present, right? To sit down and do it. And they start listing all of the stuff. You got to clean, you got to remove the stuff. So it's like create a space for her. It's like having a second lover. Like you don't bring it to a dirty room, right? You put up the dirty laundry, you, you put up the clean clothes, you, you wash the dishes. So creating that space where she can thrive. And sometimes that space is here and here. You know, not just cleaning up our physicalities, but the physicality of the mind that's, that's crowded and just too much going on. So I have to clear space and be totally comfortable with giving myself permission to being with her. You know, I used to try and, well, I did it. I wrote seven books doing a thousand other different things. And now I have the opportunity to really create that space for her because I've learned how to create that space. So it's a clearing. How do we clear for any creativity? For that garden, you first got to weed, right? Get the soil right. Does that answer that? Is that, thank you. It's probably different for every person too. And it you is. Know, different yeah. people. I mean, we are attached to our devices in such a way that we forget that the thing we spend the most time with really is our lover. So if we spend, you know, I don't know, in a 24 hour period or 12 hours awake, 10 hours with our phone and our screens. That's our lover. 
And so sometimes a no technology zone is ju just, you know, and we're afraid because what if somebody calls me and I don't answer? That's a problem, right? And, and you know, for me, it's asking my muse what she needs right then. And I, and I do refer to her as a she, but, but, but asking her, because it's me, what do I need? And what am I willing to, how am I willing to show up to address that need? So it's, putting my phone on private mode, right? Or going for a walk, an intentional walk, or doing whatever is necessary. And it is a personal, it's, it's different for everybody. But for me, it's about intentionality and mindfulness that's totally dedicated to that process. Yeah. Good evening and thank you, it's been lovely. We're in a very new space of grief. And as you've talked tonight, I hear how beautifully you've come through. But take me back, help me out <laughs> to that raw loss, the moment you get a phone call, you see the eyes close, whatever way it comes. I find myself not knowing how to do this and having moments of being so anxious that I don't know how to move forward. How did you get out of that rawness? How did you begin to let that scab over so that you could step out and do the beautiful things you both done? What an awesome question. And thank you for sharing that question because it is a river. And we are all at different spaces. People will say in time, blah, 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 blah. You must be strong, blah, 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 blah. One day you'll be able to smile, blah, 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 blah. Be where you are. Be okay with the beginning. It's like being pregnant. At the beginning, if you, you, you don't look pregnant. You look down, your belly's not big. You can't feel any fluttering, but you're throwing up all the time. You, you know something profoundly has changed and it's uncomfortable and it's new and it's painful and it's weird and you feel displaced as if you are not you anymore. Be okay with what you feel. And if you need to create some space that's just for you to feel that without others' voices in your head, claim that. That's a loving gesture for you. You'll know when it's time to take that next step. You will know. One day, you'll take a deeper breath, a deeper breath than you've taken in a very long time. And it will surprise you because you'll be like, I didn't know I had the capacity. But you cannot rush it. Grief owns no watch or barometer or yardstick or tape measure. She doesn't have those things. Pushing her away is also a challenge because she is ever patient and she will wait for you. But you may not like the way she looks when she shows up if you push her away so Sit with her, but give her a few instructions like you do your muse. Let her know you'll need some frequent breaks. Let her know that these are hard lessons, new dance, and you're barefoot and she has on boots. Let her know you need your peace. Grieving is a full-time job. Lousy, lousy benefits at the beginning. Yeah. You didn't ask me, but I'm going to answer. Oh, yes. <laughs> Since I've buried a daughter. I think we live in a culture that um, 
for a lot of us, we have to give ourselves permission to grieve because the world around us is telling us enough now. Okay, you should be over this by now. You know, and people say the darnest things to people. Oh, God has, has another angel. And I'm like, don't tell people that. <laughs> God needed an angel. That's why he took your baby. Like, nah, I don't want to hear it. But like Nina said, it's like there's no handbook for how to grieve. But we have to just let it happen. There's also no wrong it. way to do it. You can't mess it up. Right, right. You can't mess it up. But the other thing is, just like I said, having a relationship with creativity, you have to have a relationship with grief. And I think that's what Nina just exemplified. Having a relationship with grief. You know, where you're actually having conversations with her. And someone sent me something that was very instructive and useful. And it was a mantra, a writing mantra to do every morning for like 25 days. Where I was actually writing to my daughter and to grief and asking things of grief as I'm writing to her for 25 days to do this. So I think we have to come up with our own recipes, our own mantras, but we have to have a relationship with grief. You know, it's in the house, it's in the bed. There's that third person that's there. There's that third presence. The abs absence has such a powerful presence. Mm -hmm. oh, that's true. Mm -hmm. Absence creates such a full body embodiment inside of our homes and our bodies and our hearts. Mm -hmm. If we don't grieve, we become diseased. Mm -hmm. Disease will find us. Mm -hmm. So true. So my hands are crippled because of grief. Cripple because of grief. So we have to be the vessel, but reminding ourselves that grief is not going to take a full residency. Like this is a residency. We can't tell it you have six months. But if we remind ourselves it's a residency like they're not moving in, like we're, we're not building that container for them. But we are building some containers so they can do what they need to do with us, what grief needs to do. Grief has a mission. Grief has a purpose. I also think that we get confused about um, what grief is and is not. Whatever you are feeling is what it is. You're hungry, you're not hungry. Your stomach hurts, your heart really hurts. I thought heartache was like, you know, some colloquial, that thing really hurts. Like somebody punched me in the chest. It is a real thing and it can have physical consequences, but this is what you have to remember. The deeper the love, the harder the grief. Some people are worth grieving. Other people, it's like, bye. <laughs> but when it's somebody close to you, it's kind of supposed to hurt yeah. because they meant something and it's worth it. And if you push grief away, you also have to push away the love. Mm. And you don't want to do that. So you invite them to coexist. And even though it feels crummy and wrong and... I don't want it to be like this. It's fine to say that. But you still, you show up, you show up, you keep showing up and you don't stop saying their name and you don't act like it didn't happen. You keep showing up. And when it's their birthday, you make a birthday cake and you don't eat it all by yourself. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Share the birthday cake. Say their name, celebrate the anniversary in whatever way you want. When people are around you and they're like talking about sports and the weather and 
Awkward silences. Say their name. I didn't want to make you sad. As if. As if. You're not always sad. Don't let it be the elephant in the room that everybody tiptoes around. It's, it's, it's different for everyone. I really, I, I, I do have a podcast called Great Grief and it, is, it chronicles my journey with my grief, which I am, it's still ongoing. That's why I can't say it's done. But Great Grief is stories and singing in that space that feels safe. So check that out on WUNC Radio the, and everywhere you get your podcast, they told me to say. <laughs> Not good grief, but great grief. Um, And I think safe spaces like this one where we can talk about it are so important because there are big ones and small ones, these griefs. Sometimes it's something as as quote unquote tiny as I couldn't go to the prom because of COVID. That's real for some people for whom the prom was really a big deal. Any other questions? Um, I want to thank you all for this conversation. It's, uh, we're talking about grief, but we're really talking about love. Mm-hmm. And it's such an act of love for you all to share your, your vulnerability and your journey. And I just thank you for doing this. Thank you. And uh, I think about, I'm, I'm a quilter, and I think about my art as a container for my disease, for my grief, for my pain. You know, every stitch is a prayer. But it's also a container for my future. Those quilts are, I create those quilts for my children and potential grandchildren. I don't have those, but those are also, you know, children and grandchildren are also the containers for our future. And so I create that as a way for our, my story to live on. My grandmother's story, for my mother's story, because they were quilters also. And so I just want to you know, what are some of your containers for your future also? What are, how, how is your creativity a container for your future? Well, um, research. So re- research is one of them uh, for new work that I'm working on. Um, the, the book that I wrote about my daughter has been choreographed. It's been staged. Thinking about where else it can live in the world and how it can live in the world and how it has become a functional embodiment. It's, it's bigger than her. Um, so that's one of the containers is to keep writing. So that creativity, like I have a thousand containers for poetry, not just one, because there are different pieces that I'm working on. They're just different. You know, there, there's a huge historical project I'm working on. There's this other piece about what else can I want to un- undie you be future projects with Nina, future projects. Like I've got a lot going on. All of those are containers. Um, being able to travel again and show up for collaborations across the ocean that was not possible. Those are new containers. And, and my children and my, my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. That's why we really do the work. You know, this ain't to be cute and to, you know what I mean? All the accolades. It's, it's really just like the ancestors did for us. Prepared, passed on the torch. It's about legacy. It's about doing the work. And the work becomes a good legacy to leave behind. If that makes sense. I'm constantly, I'm like you, I I get awakened in the middle of the night with ideas and things that I would like to to pursue and do. And I like also, because I live in my head a lot, I love doing things with my hands. So my gardening is definitely a place to put into motion a different kind of of energy. Uh, I am moving more into a writing world with, my Great Grief podcast, but also just musings, just whatever comes up and respecting it enough to put it on paper. Or if I, if it's coming too fast, I'll just speak it into my voice memo on my phone and later on we can transcribe it. So that's, 
you know, there's a joy in walking down this path of memory and remembrance and irony and just things that, you know, isn't it funny that such and such and such a thing happened that I'm able to pull up now from my memory that would not have occurred to me had not these events, my sister's passing and my husband's passing. I, I wouldn't, time traveler wouldn't be born. Great grief wouldn't have been born. So I have to acknowledge that being in this space created an opportunity for me to speak with authenticity, with this broken voice and to ask questions, to be curious. What does a widow look like? Do I have to take this ring off now? He's been passed on since 2019. When does it come off? Well, not today, clearly. Who, what do I call myself? Who am I now? These are all questions that swirl around in my head constantly, and I can't even spell single. Can't even spell it. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, I am still very much married. So there is still this tension, this push and pull, this reminder. Whenever I say the word, my husband wa was, it gets stuck in my throat. I don't want to use the past tense. So, you know, I, I don't know where I will be or where I shall be in months, years to come, but at this moment, I am, you know, in the middle of the big muddy, chest deep in it, and um, not, not feeling like I'm drowning as I was, but I'm still at least chest deep. Yeah, talking about chest deep, you know, the work becomes those oars so you don't drown. You know, good work. So I'd like to thank the museum for uh, stepping outside of um, its container yes, yes. and actually having two artists talk about something that's personal and dear. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Um, and I wasn't cutting off questions. We have a, a little bit of time, but it's been a full evening if there are any more questions. Are there any more questions? Yes, you had a question. Well, you know, you kind of answered it, but I really just want to, yeah. can you, I can speak up. I'm used to get a microphone. Yeah. I don't, okay. We're live streaming, <laughs> so we want to make sure that you're heard. Um, I really just wanted to know how you jumped off with journaling. I, I want so much to journal, but I tend to avoid her. And I just want to know how, where, at what point did you just start your journaling? And how I've, you I've been journaling since high school. So, ever. you know, mostly it was about boys <laughs> that I liked or thought I liked, <laughs> you know, some of it is quite embarrassing. You know, some of it is like, but it was where I was. And there are times when I've experienced what you call writer's block. And um, not because I was trying to write past something, just because I had made a practice of writing. And if you show up, I guarantee you something, even if it's like, I don't have anything to say today. Usually it's a voice in your head that's saying, you have to write something important, something profound, something grammatically correct, something witty, something important. That's not it at all. Write something silly, you know, write about whatever comes up for you in that moment. And that's good enough. And as you show up, and this is any practice, you will, you know, it'll evolve into something that it, whatever it needs to be for you. If you don't show up, that's when spirit can't do anything with that. Thank you for that inspiration. Oh, <laughs> you're welcome.
Well, we want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Jackie, I do think that we came up with something new called creative medicine uh, when we have conversations with you and artists, uh, singers and dancers. But everyone, let's please give a hand to <laughs> Gina Freelon and North Carolina Poet Laureate and our residents. This event was live streamed and so it is on our YouTube channel and you can watch it tonight. Thank you all so much. Thank you.